Welcome everyone to our first Implementers Showcase. We are so thrilled that you are all here. It's been an incredible effort from a number of implementers to prepare updates for you today. We are hoping that this session is going to become a quarterly event where every couple of months we will get together like this and hear updates from some of our implementers from around the world. And the goal of these implementers showcases is for our whole community to see and understand, number one, what priorities our field implementers are working on, and number two, what things are shared across implementers that community members or other implementers or service providers and so forth may be interested in collaborating on. Okay, well, uh, on that note, I've got a um, somewhat tentative agenda here uh, at the start with the different groups that we'll be presenting today. Now that uh, it's a couple minutes past the top of the hour, I'm going to go ahead and send a big welcome to our first presenter today from Partners in Health, and that's Ellen Ball. I'm going to give a warm reminder to all of our presenters that you will have no more than 10 minutes. In Ellen's case, I'll give her a couple of minutes more since we uh, uh, are starting a little late here, but I will have to stop you at 10 minutes just to respect the other presenters' time because we did end up with quite a full slate today. Ellen, uh, we will, we're excited to hear from you. I can run through the slides since I'm sharing my screen as you talk if you'd like. Why don't you go ahead? Thank you very much, Grace. Um, can I guess everybody can hear me? Otherwise, let me know. Um, I, I will start the presentation and my colleague Burke Moss in Rwanda will talk about the great work in Rwanda, but I certainly want to give credit to the many people on the Partners in Health team and the Open Immersed community for mo much of what you'll see today. Next slide. So um, I'll run through many of the highlights that we've done. Actually, I'm covering things more than the past quarter. Uh, COVID, as you're well aware, started um, at least for us in, in um, January, February, March, when we started to see cases. And it was great that we had OpenMRS in place in Mirbelay Hospital and we're able to add functionality for COVID. So facility-based forms, admission, daily progress and discharge forms for the hospital. Um, also, we added lab orders for, especially for COVID tests, which they wanted to track and report specifically for COVID. We also deployed COVID at an additional hospital that did not have open MRS. Next slide. So um, one thing that I thought could be interesting for the community is to show how we're using PEDAL and data visualization tools. In this case, this was created by Power BI to show what we're collecting in OpenMRS um, for COVID. So this uh, bar charts are showing things like patient admission by date into COVID unit symptoms um, and comorbidities that are collected on COVID forms and information about the number of patients per month placed on oxygen. Um, we also collect in information about staff. So if you're staff within the hospital, we know that healthcare workers are more susceptible or the numbers have been higher for COVID. So we're collecting that also. Next slide. Liberia. So I know my friend Tommy is on the call. Um, Tommy and others, Branford, have been working on uh, at this system in Liberia and rolled out OpenMRS at JJ Dawson Hospital. We had had the system in place down the road, about a half an hour drive in a health center in Plebo uh, for the past five years, but now they're using it for NCD and mental health at the hospital in Harper, Liberia. Next slide. 
Um, another uh, accomplishment, and this is something that we rolled out in, I believe in April, was um, using ComCare for home visits, but it's connected using um, data forwarding between ComCare and OpenMRS. So in this quick example, um, on the right, we're showing what the tablet or phone would show, which are these brief questions using ComCare of a hospital. When you're in the home, you're saying that this patient should be referred to care. Um, in this case, this is a maternal follow-up form and whether or not it's urgent or not urgent. On the left is the configuration code in ComCare that maps between the ComCare questions and the concept uh, UIDs. Next slide. And here's um, one way that we're showing the data in the case of, of the same forms that we're doing in ComCare. We have similar forms in OpenMRS um, to show what we're collecting for referral, vital signs, danger signs, et cetera. But in this case, one of the nice features is that we're able to track referrals to the hospital. Those questions that I showed on the previous screen on ComCare, where you refer a patient with a certain urgency can be recorded at the hospital so that you can keep track of what patients you're expecting to see and follow up on them so patients are not lost to follow up. Um, next slide. We have been working on a lab workflow module orders and results for the lab to enter for the lab tests, but it's only um, in the spring that we actually deployed this for the first time in Mirbelay. Um, so I thought it was worth mentioning that. Uh, thanks very much to the team. This was a very big, long effort by many people. Next slide. Burke Moss, could you take over from here? Thanks, Ellen. You hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Okay. Uh, here in Rwanda, uh, Rwanda government with uh, PH and B, we are upgrading open marriage from uh, 1922. We are we tried to create a Rwanda Yuma Destro and also we created the migration script uh, using uh, which is running using so that we can uh, migrate our data which are of one month region to two context also we had the problem of managing opposite because we are we, we are providing the chemotherapy drugs so we had the module called on uh, other extension uh, module which was running on one nine uh, one nine so uh, now we upgraded it so that it can run on a regular signal. Also, uh, SYNC 1 has been upgraded because of uh, SYNC 2 was under uh, in project. So, SYNC 1 is running also on uh, two projects. It, it has been upgraded also. Uh, so we have here in Rwanda other models, example, being model, pharmacy and laboratory model. Those are also applicable. Those models have been also upgraded and two complex. All of these are phase one. Now that phase one is a level of implementation, like now we are implementing the pilot uh pilot uh, facilities where we are in at the main hospital the second phase will be the very 
in the investments application. So if the planning allow, or if there is no change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bert Moss. That was great. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so one of the big projects we did over the summer was um, changing the way that PIHMR is configured and simplifying this so that the configuration code was this kind of disentangled from the code itself. And Sorry, Ellen, um, Dirk Smith, can you just mute, please? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, Let's so, ahead, yeah, no problem. So the metadata could be disangle, disentangled from the code. And that was true for forms, concepts, drugs, reports, and locations. And this makes it so that it's much easily uh, updatable. Uh, thanks, Mark and the team for, for doing so much of this work. Next slide. We have done a ton of work and continue to be in the midst. This is ongoing work, um, but really important to be able to migrate data for the past 20 years on HIV patients in Haiti. Uh, intake, follow-up, dispensing multi-month, and PUPFAR reporting. Next slide. And these are possible areas of collaboration. I'll talk fast. So micro front end, OCL, and OCL for OpenMRS, condition list, which needs to get finished and would be a great help for our point of care and clinicians. Um, trying to use Mazima, especially for offline capabilities and building up dashboard widgets. Uh, in this example, these are things that would be nice to show on a COVID dashboard to show progress of these symptoms during a hospital stay for a patient. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much to Ellen and Berkmas and the whole uh, PIH team. On that note, uh, next up on our agenda, we have UMB Nigeria, and that will be Ahmed presenting. Uh, Ahmed, are you here and ready to go? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Yes, we're here. Um, on behalf of UMB, um, presenter will be Morrison. Morrison. So, hi, hi, hello, everyone. Welcome, Morrison. Take it away. You have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so um, um, I would like to share my screen. Okay, yeah, turn on. So once again, good afternoon, everyone. So um, yeah, in Nigeria, we've done a whole um, lot of work, but um, I would like to start with the first one, which is the um, inventory model. And um, what this does is um, it um, enables us to um, track um, usage of um, um, commodity data, talking about RTKs and um, testing kits and also um, pharmacy drug at the facility. So um, actually, it's um, we build upon um, the open HMIS um, inventory model and we're able to modify it to um, the Nigeria program um, um, needs. So um, basically, on this model, we have like two major um, aspects. So, which is the the administrative area where you have the managed inventory. So, in here, you can manage the various RTK, the testing points, um, and also different facilities that would want to um, um, transact um, RTKs with some um, other facility, and also even the stock room. So, here is more of administrative um, area. Then um, the daily um, routine operation is done in the inventory tax. And that's um, where you have the inventory control card. So with this, we'll be able to um, perform basically like um, six different operations. You could um, receive um, our tickets at the facility. And um, uh, this will be turned to the stockroom. And from there, so, um, those RTK could um, be distributed to other um, testing point within the um, facility. And there are tons of other operations we can do here as well. Talking about the 
um, adjustment of um, the commodity stock and also even transfer of commodity from one um, facility to the other. So um, then lastly, I would like to mention that, um, uh, so there, there's also um, the um, tracking of the usage data as well. So after receiving the, this commodity at, at, at the various testing point, we also use this model to um, track the usage at the testing point. So depending on what is used at some different testing points, you could um, manage it with this um, model. So all you need to do is specify the testing point, the amount to use, losses, and all that. That has been um, handled using this model as well. Then lastly, um, the data generated from this model could be exported to um, the NDR so that um, the, the data can monitor from a central um, location and it could also help in um, better um, decision making since um, all this data can be seen from one location and um, from different facilities as well. We could see what is being used, what is um, being um, delivered, um, sent to that facility, how um, different um, commodities that are being moved from one facility to the other. So all that can be exported from, from this extraction. All you need to do is set, select the start and end date and we get the um, exchange file that we can upload on the NDR. And um, the NDR is a national data repository in Nigeria that's still being managed by UMB. So I'll stop here for commodity. The next um, project I would like to talk about is the is the limbs um, integration. So we had a need to um, come up with an exchange medium between the lab and information system and the EMR. So um, that's what we've worked on. And what's, what um, that does is um, after um, <clears throat> sample requisition has been done at the facility, the um, data of the patient, the lab um, record can be sent automatically from the EMR to, to the um, lab um, system. Or before now, they do um, use the paper form and it's kind of increased the turnaround time. So the major goal of this project is to um, make that electronic so that um, the, that, that wait time for the results, they can send the lab information directly to the lab um, information system. And also when the result is ready, um, we can use this model to um, retrieve the, the result as well. All is done within this uh, model. So um, I can't really um, go through all of this, but so I'll just um, show us how it's done. So the first thing is um, they do like a date range of the um, lab um, orders that they want to send. So, so this, is, this is an example. You can see the sample ID the names of the patient and all that. So <clears throat> to select which of them they want to send and the next thing is it generates the manifest. And these are more, like, more or less the information on the manifest. And after filling all this, you click the save button. So this kind of send this sample information to the lab information system. And um, with this model, you can generate a PDF document that we serve as a manifest that the rider would um, attach to the sample to the PCR lab for testing. And when the result is ready, we can retrieve the result as well from this um, model. So um, all those um, data has been tracked, the date of essay, the date result, um, or the date result was released, the date it got to the facility, the date it got to the PCR lab, all this information has been tracked by the model and um, we could um, look through to see where <clears throat> the lapses are coming from so that um, that would help um, to make some very critical decision to um, help the program um, much, much better and better. So that is that for the um, EMR limbs exchange. So the next one I want to talk about is um, SORGE or favorable the linkage model. So what this does is um, um, it's, it does basically two things. The first is um, it links um, Clients that have been tested in the fields because we have community testers. Um, we have testers in the community, and after um, testing patients, so they do generate like a unique code. So with this model, we'll help to link those um, clients to care when they get to the facility. So um, with that code, they get to the go to the facility, and you can use this model to retrieve their information and 
um, automatically register them as a patient after doing some form of counseling. And that is one. So the other thing is um, you can also use this model for um, index and contact tracing. So that's another important concept of this uh, model. So um, these are like this um, the major dashboard of this of the model. So um, we can view the community testers. So this, this, this is just for demo purpose. So these are like the community testers that are attached to this particular facility right now. These are, these are the testers in the field. So we can manage all that from the module. Um, so when a client gets to the facility with the unique code, the um, search monitors can retrieve that um, client's information using that code. As soon as it's typed here, you click on search, you pull down, you pull down the um, client's information and after confirming that that's the right details, you can continue to register, you can go on to register that client as a patient. So um, that's that for here. And um, another thing is for the contact tracing, uh, permit me to move on to the dashboard. So I'll just pick any patient, let's say this patient here. So now we now have like you, this is like a patient, that's into, that's um, registered um, into care, and um, if um, after doing some um, a bit of contact elicitation, we, we find that there, there's a we we able to get some contact for this patient. We we'll do what we call um, with this link here. We can track those contacts, so it's called contact elicitation right here. This link right here. So I'll click on it. So um, we can see we have the contact listing. So these are the contacts that have been gotten. For, for this patient as at now. If there are more, we click on this create contact and this form here will help us capture information for the contacts. So you can see relationship, the first name. And um, with this, you can even um, assign that contact to a community tester. And instantly this tester at the, at the community gets this contact and the, the tester can go ahead to trace that um, particular um, contact and the cycles continue. You understand? So um, I don't want to do much on this. That's that for um, the linkage model. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, the POC. And um, in Nigeria, we've uh, been able to work on the point of care uh, model. And um, with this, we can um, we kind of give specialized and rule based access to um, various. Um, um, testing point uh, at the farm facility. So various users of the EMR have specialized um, um, access so that um, you only get to see what you need to work on. And um, <clears throat> so that's that's done with um, um, alongside the location uh, feature of open marriage. We will Hello? Have, we will give you one more minute and then we need to move on to the next presenter. Okay, okay. So um, with this, we can um, have specialized access to different um, users. So for, for HTS, ANC, different um, um, users, when you log in, they get to see only what they, they need to work on. And also, this is um, this has been um, built alongside with the QM um, model. So with the QM model, patients will be um, assigned to various service center using the key model and that would help um, various users to um, properly attend to patient knowing where they're, where they're supposed to be and using the service area to properly um, give um, patients the right um, care that they need. So um, even the forms as well have been modified to um, show only what a user is supposed to um, work on. So thank you so much. Thank you, over. Thank you very much, UMB Nigeria. That is just excellent to see. Um, so if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, Morrison, then uh, we will. Perfect. Thank you so much. Just great to have you here today. Uh, next on our list, we have IntelliSoft. So I have some slides here. If you like, I can um, keep these uh, ready to go and turn through them as we go. So I'll hand this over to Steve, Ken, and Susan. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for sharing the screen. So I'll be speaking about two key projects that we've been working on. We've been working on the cross-border digital health solution along the Uganda-Kenya border. 
and we also continued to work on the Nairobi County non-communicable quality management diseases electronic medical system. So first off, uh, next slide. First off, I'll start off with the, the cross-border digital solution. Um, so this, this project involves the governments of Kenya and Uganda and a couple of partners, including uh, USID uh, FHI 360. So the goal of the, the project is to design, customize, and deploy the uh, across border digital health solution technology to strengthen the cross border health system through an existing model that it's called the cross border health unit, which brings together um, facilities uh, and healthcare workers from the various facilities across the Kenya, Uganda, uh, Buddha region, where they share uh, they share the they share the proceedings of the patients in this region. So as a proof of concept, this solution is demonstrating the significance of data sharing just to ensure that this continuum of care for mobile populations. Also, it's been used to provide a basis for discussions around health data policies and frameworks. Um, uh, so to achieve this goal, we worked with the with FHI 360, governments of Kenya and Uganda, and of course the East African community, just so that we could have an, an interoperable care delivery and insight system that would improve care across uh, the cross-border and mobile populations. It also made sure that this solution can also interconnect health facilities and health systems just to enable data sharing across the, the participating facilities. It also brought around a platform for linking the national uh, the local, national, and regional data warehouses, uh, including DHIS2 and other EMRs in the exist. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so on the screen, I have the. Uh, please go back. Yes. But on the screen, we have the architecture of the cross-border digital health solution. So you'll notice it's split into two regions. Uh, one side is the Uganda region side, and then the other side is the Kenya side. At the bottom, you'll notice the participating uh, um, solutions. We have Uganda EMR in Uganda. Uh, and then on the Kenya side, we have Kenya EMR, uh, Ampath uh, MRS and Medic Mobile. So we set this up just to allow patients moving from any of the facilities in the region with either of these facilities to continue receiving care. Next slide, please. Yeah. So our main outcomes and achievements through this project is we're able to effectively engage stakeholders, uh, achieving government-led and owned uh, uh, the cross-border digital health solution. So this solution was an, as a result of discussions from these two joint meetings, uh, which endorsed the solution and enabled us to continue working within the region. So after that, we were able to conduct a, we were able to conduct a digital health readiness assessment at 37 facilities, 13 facilities being in Kenya and 24 facilities in Uganda. Uh, at the end of it, we were able to upgrade Kenya EMR and AMRS at facilities in Busia, Kenya. We also managed to enhance Uganda EMR, um, but we, we didn't manage to implement that uh, last quarter. We also managed to train the county health management teams and the partners on this solution between July and September this year. And we're able to set up local servers uh, at the national level and also at the county level uh, in August, and we're able to hand over equipment to support this. So the outcome of this activity is that there was strengthened data sharing between the Buddha facilities, uh, particularly those using Kenya EMR and AMRS in Busia, Kenya. And also we managed to achieve near real time access to cross border data for decision making across all levels, whether at the facility, county, or at the national level. Next slide. Uh, so and the implementation of the CBS, um, 
it has been a it has been a consultative process involving stakeholders just to ensure that we have a need driven digital health solution out of this we've been able to leverage on and enhance the existing emrs uh, kenya emr emrs and uganda emr to include the cross border health data so uh, manual data was was digitized so we have an we had an estimated uh, 2000 at clinics in the nine facilities uh, that uh, took up that embraced this solution uh, yeah and then lessons learned uh, the cross-border health data integrated in national health e-health systems is a game changer for quality care planning and accountability next slide uh, so i'll move over to the uh, nairobi county uh, NCD system. Uh, so this system has been in use since January 2018. So we're aiming to strengthen the healthcare system through improved capacity in the management of select NCDs. And this was mainly diabetes and hypertension. So uh, we have a mobile application, uh, an Android mobile application, and of course, the open MRS uh, web application uh, just to allow users to access the system. So the, you can see on the screen uh, the partners involved. We have, of course, now it's called Nairobi Metropolitan uh, NMS, and then we had Malteser, PMZ, uh, AHD, and of course Intellisoft. Next slide. So the value of the system is to strengthen the healthcare system, uh, uh, then ensure that the, the clinicians are able to adhere to the existing national clinical guidelines, of course, digitize data, uh, ensure there's interoperability with existing e-health tools, uh, particularly DHIS2 for national reporting, and then just making sure that we have a tool that's innovative with a feature out to, to accommodate um, to accommodate to accommodate a lot more in the future. Next slide. So the system has been co-designed and implemented with the user. It has inbuilt clinical decision schemas. It is location-based. Uh, it has it offers concurrent user support has a couple of resources for the users including frequently asked questions the clinical guidelines and the health desk it has extensively disaggregated reports uh, per the per the ministry of health uh, stipulations it has offline capabilities through the mobile application it has intelligent recalls for follow-ups uh, which is tied to patient notification via sms alerting patients that they are appointment is coming soon uh, or they missed that and then it's also integrated with the existing e health tools next slide uh, so in summary for the project for the ncd project we have this uh, this solution implemented in 45 facilities uh, 23 of them are public and 22 are private and faith-based uh, faith and this has been implemented in four counties in nairobi um four counties in Nairobi. it's a shared it's a it's one system on the cloud uh, so the facilities share the database but it's role-based access meaning that ability only access the information of the patients uh of their of their individual facility so this system has significantly improved adherence to the clinical guidelines uh, for them in managing hypertension and diabetes so Subsequently, it strengthened the healthcare system. It has improved the capacity in managing NCDs within Nairobi's informal settlements. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so I just put in a few screenshots of the web application. Then next slide. And a few more of the mobile application. Yeah, I think my presentation ends there. Wonderful, thank you so much, Susan, and, and the whole team for putting that together. <laughs> what, a, what a big amount of updates. On that note, uh, I will hand things over to the team at Vecnicares. That is Paul Amendola and Samir Mutwani. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, 
we're just going to go through uh, three projects uh, really quickly. Um, a little bit of background on Vecna Cares. Uh, um, not too well known. We're a, a nonprofit organization based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and with field offices in Nairobi and Tanzania. Um, there is a combination of uh, software where we have started using um, OpenMRS and DHIS uh, combined with a hardware solution and uh, uh, measurement and analytic guidelines. Paul, would you just mind making your slides full screen there? Sure. Uh, good. Is that okay? That's great. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to go through three projects uh, really quickly today. First is uh, I deliver based on um, focusing on maternal mortality uh, and, and two, uh, two key approaches around reducing maternal mortality, uh, improving situational awareness of the caregiver uh, during a complication and increasing the adherence to published protocols. Uh, this is a snapshot of the I Deliver landing page. Um, everything that you're seeing here has been designed with the end user, uh, both in uh, India, Tanzania, uh, and Kenya. Uh, in the patient tile is, uh, is all the demographic information, including all of the risk factors. Uh, there is decision support uh, uh, designed specifically for I deliver based on the WHO guidelines. Um, as signs and symptoms are added into uh, are, are, are entered for the patient um, in real time, uh, there will be uh, possible diagnoses that are presented, which can then be either confirmed or rejected, or a provider has the opportunity to add their own um, to add their own diagnosis. Uh, a nursing cardex is available. One of the things we did notice during uh, some of the early pilot uh, projects, we were trying to keep all of the information on one digital file um, rather than having caregivers switch between. Um, switch between notebooks or Excel sheets uh, and and our solution was the, the digital nursing card X, which allows uh, caregiver notes, whether they be a doctor's note or a, a nurse's note. Um, the data collection forms can be customized um, and with, uh, with validation. And we added a left-hand menu um, where users can toggle between the different forms and start the workflow at any point. Um, uh, start the workflow at any point within the um, within the patient journey, uh, depending on when the woman arrives to the facility, and any any of the work um, any of the completed forms are indicated with a, a check mark. Um, we have location and role based uh, login. And uh, the patient queue aggregates uh, all of the users into our ward dashboard. There's a couple things on the ward dashboard just to look, just to, to look over. Um, our our primary use case scenario is one caregiver with multiple providers, uh, with multiple patients, uh, is what we were, is the challenge we were looking to solve. Uh, what this allows is uh, how, we, how we solved that was an acuity score. The acuity score is based on uh, the presenting signs and symptoms in combination with 
how long it has been since the patient has seen a provider. Um, five being the, um, the least severe all the way to one, which is the most severe uh, and their number and color coded. What this allows is a care provider to see an entire roster of patients on the ward dashboard and see who is the most critical, uh, hopefully then reducing the time between uh, when a patient arrives um, and they are, they are seen by a provider based on their severity. Uh, we have added um, COVID-19 screening. And what you're looking at now is uh, the decision support plans. The, dis the decision support plans we, uh, that are currently implemented, um, we, are, we are revisiting. Uh, they're fairly text heavy. Um, we're moving to more of a surgical list model. Uh, this, sorry, really quickly, the iDeliver project is now in 14 health facilities. Um, and has been used in over 12,000 uh, pregnancies or 12,000 deliveries um, across East Africa. Uh, our next project is in Asili. It's a, it's a smaller project, uh, multiple facilities in DRC, primarily outpatient billing service, outpatient health services and billing and receipt functionality. Uh, this is also built on open MRS. Um, uh, it's a little bit more of a streamlined workflow. Uh, again, we have a left-hand menu um, and users are guided along uh, the workflow um, with intuitive, uh, configurable um, uh, signs and symptoms. Um, clinical decision support, uh, is is also going to be implemented uh, as well as tracking um, uh, vaccination or, or or child days the the immunization days our goal with this our goal with this project is not only uh, data analytics uh, on a high view but also uh, uh, a singular patient record Um, uh, outside of the visit forms, one of the other key uh, key outputs uh, needs to be an easy to print, easy to read receipt, um, which is automatically generated based on the the services that were provided. Lastly, the the Special Olympics project. Um, there is a um, uh, there's a challenge in treating uh, patients with intellectually disabled patients. Uh, there's a different set of protocols, uh, a different level of training and comfort. Um, as a solution, Special Olympics at their athletic events um, also uh, holds a series of different sort of health screenings. Um, from those health screenings, we wanted to aggregate the data for analysis, but also start to collect event level data into individual medical records. Um, this is an open MRS uh, event based dashboard uh, that has been created. Um, and we also have um, we also have all of the data from the event and across events um, moving into a data warehouse uh, that is then moved into that is that is integrated with uh, with Power BI. Um, I have. Um, uh, these are all the, the links to the demos, um, which I can, I can send around as well. 
Um, this is this is Special Olympics. These are these are the different. Um, these are the uh, the different health screening areas. That then aggregate up into the into the dashboard and into uh, the Power BI report. Um, we have now developed iDeliver as a standalone module within OpenMRS. Um, so after after patient registration, um, that patient could go into iDeliver. Uh, this is a good example of differences in acuity level. Um, if if the 53 of us were caregivers, uh, the fourth patient on the list uh, would be the one we would go to first. Um, uh, they would be the most critical uh, based on uh, their, it looks like fetal distress. Um, and it's been about, if you look in the upper right, it's been about 45 minutes uh, since they were last seen. Um, Again, the uh, all of the all of the COVID, all of the um, clinical decision support works in real time. Um, so, as more information is fed into iDeliver, the the more accurate the um, uh, the the diagnosis uh, is um, is presented. Uh, but it's a one minute uh, time check. Great. Uh, I just want to cover one last thing. Um, the hardware por uh, portion uh, of Vecna Cares is the Clinipack. The Clinipack is essentially a ruggedized server uh, which allows any type of software to be um, installed onto the Clinipack and then broadcast over an area. The, the Clinipack also has power management capabilities to switch between solar, uh, an available colored battery, an internal battery, any AC uh, power, and it also has networking capabilities um, uh, it's possible to, to uh, insert a SIM card into the Clinipack. This is essentially how the Clinipack works. Our use case is one Clinipack per facility. Um, it, and then all of the devices log on to the to the Wi-Fi. No data is stored on the, the devices. Everything is stored in real time onto the Clinipack. And we have a number of projects. All of the Asili projects and most of our Kenya projects are working completely offline uh, using the using the the Clinipack. That's the, that's the end. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Paul. We really appreciate it. Very exciting update. If you can stop sharing your screen for us, then I will bring back up ours here. Um, so a quick a quick update on the presentation order. Thank you so much, everyone, for your present uh, your patience with us as we um, go through this first exercise together. I'll go ahead and share my screen. So a quick update to the agenda. Ampath is going next, followed by IHS, and then the Bonni point nine three feature update and then followed by Palladium Kenya EMR. And finally, we'll end off with a proposal about role-based permissions. So uh, over to Ampath. So I believe that role by Kitya, you are, oh, Eric is presenting. I will just go ahead and uh, let you take over. Over to you, Eric, you have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Grace. So uh, welcome to the Ampath. Uh, point of care system. My name is Eric and um, I'm representing the product management team. So you'll notice today that uh, most of the front end features that uh, Ampath is using and uh, yeah, so Grace, next screen. Next screen. So maybe just to give you a highlight of uh, what we have uh, for our presentation today. Backwards, Grace. Yeah, so the first uh, thing that we'd want to showcase for today is uh, the program manager. 
maybe just you can move to the next screen. Yeah, the program manager, which is a tool uh, that you use at Ampath for enrolling and uh, also to transfer patients into various programs that you have uh, in Ampath and also switch between locations when uh, patients are switching between Ampath locations. So currently we have uh, three departments in Ampath that use uh, our point of care system, which is oncology, uh, CDM, chronic disease management, and uh, the HIV clinic. So we use the program manager feature to switch uh, between uh, programs in the three departments. Next screen, please. So we have a case management tool that we introduced recently. Uh, the reason we introduced uh, this feature was uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 uh, COVID period. And uh, this tool is used as a, collaborate, uh, as a collaborative tool for assessment, uh, planning, and facilitating uh, uh, care and evaluating advocacy for comprehensive health care needs. Uh, I'll showcase this maybe later on in the presentation, so we can just move to the next screen, please. So related to that uh, case management, we also do COVID-19 screening uh, for all our patients that come to clinic at Ampath. So we have a tool that manages that. Our next screen, Grace. We also have the community group manager for managing HIV stable patients. So we have scenarios where patients are stable and uh, they are probably not able to come to clinic to collect their medication. So we have a tool where they can organize themselves, uh, uh, come up with a group, and uh, from the group, they select, a, uh, they nominate a leader, and uh, that leader will come to the clinic and uh, collect medication for all the group members. So that saves time and also uh, helps in to assist patients who are not able to come to clinic, yet they require the medication. So something to note about this is that uh, it's only for stable patients, not uh, all, uh, all patients that are, that are registered in the, in the point of care system. So this is used to manage stable patients. So next screen, Grace. So we have a couple of priorities that we have uh, in our uh, next quarter. So one has been harmonizing the data between Kenya EMR and MRS. And the uh, first thing important is to bring Kenya EMR and MRS under one system. So we are trying to integrate concepts between uh, Kenya EMR and MRS so that uh, they can speak to each other. And uh, the next thing that you're supposed to do in the next quarter that you're giving priority as well is integration of ADT. And the ADT is our pharmacy system. And uh, we are trying just to make sure that uh, our point of care system, which is MRS, uh, speaks to the pharmacy system. Uh, yeah, that's uh, integration of ADT and POC. And then uh, we've uh, also, uh, in the past quarter, we've uh, had uh, cross-border data being input into our system, but uh, we've not had reports for the same. So we are working on a report that uh, has some uh, predefined indicators that uh, should show up in within our point of care system. So that is work in progress and uh, soon we shall be having uh, that in our point of care system within this quarter. And then we're also working on uh, trying to put a uh, pilot the HTS, that's HIV testing services. And uh, the initiative is to go electronic with the HIV testing services and uh, to ensure that you capture that data also in the point of care system. So maybe Grace, if I'm allowed to share my screen, I would want to showcase how the case manager works. Please do, I believe you have four minutes left. So I'll quickly share my screen. I hope uh, you're able to see my screen. So the case management feature uh, was put under our clinic dashboard. You'll notice that we have three uh, items here. When you log into POC, we usually have the patient dashboard, clinic dashboard, and the data analytics dashboard for reports. So our case management feature is under the clinic dashboard. And uh, you can see it is the fourth item there. 
So as I mentioned uh, previously, the case management is used to manage patients who are not able to come to clinic during this, uh, maybe those who are not able to come to clinic during this COVID period and uh, our clinicians would like to know how they're faring on. So this is the initial page, how it looks like. It has several indicators here, as you can see. So whichever indicator you select, the filters will be according to your indicator. So let's try and load uh, patients for location test. I'll use a uh, test location because uh, it's just uh, for demo purposes. So I'll load cases for location test. And here I was trying to load uh, patients that already have a case manager. You can switch as well and try and find those patients that do not have a case manager. And I'll show you how we do assignment of case managers to our patients. So you can see all these columns here. These are um, patient uh, details, further details. So note that these are just test patients. So we have this column here that it says uh, that's uh, assign, assign manager. So from this button, so there's two ways where we, how we, of, of how we do our assignment of managers. So we can do individual assignment and you can do mass assignment. So if you want to do individual assignment, that's how you go about it. Hit the uh, assign manager button. And uh, since our patient already has a case manager, we can switch the case manager. And when I hit save, that's already done. So, we also have a process of uh, filling a phone telecare form from this point. So when I log in as a, maybe say, if I, if I would want to see maybe the, those cases that have been assigned to me and uh, I want to follow up on those patients, there's a follow up button here. So when I hit that follow up button, it takes me to the patient dashboard. And from here, I can go to the program, the HIV program that the patient is enrolled into. I start a visit. And here I should be able to fill the telecare form, which in this case I'd already filled earlier. So let me just show you how it looks like. So this is how our telecare form uh, looks like. And uh, before we initiate a telephone call, uh, there's always this section that we usually, uh, in, there's always this section. Sorry. Yeah, there's always a section that uh, you have to confirm with the patient whether they are consenting to that uh, telecare conversation before you go ahead and fill this telecare form. So this telecare form has uh, several questions that are hard coded in the form. And notice that we also have a COVID screening section here that uh, captures that data for COVID-19 COVID screening. So these are also hard-coded in the form. And uh, this option here is dependent on uh, the outcomes that you select on these uh, four questions above. So after that, you save your form. And uh, meanwhile, you're filling this form, you're talking to the patient. And uh, when you save, think you're done. So for purposes of time, I think I was only able to show you um, the case manager. And maybe just to go back to the case manager, I think I have a few minutes, Chris. So... Sorry, Eric, I think we need to call time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine then. <laughs> it's okay then. Okay, fine. Thanks, Chris. Thank you so much. All, All right, right. Um, Eric, if you could stop sharing your screen there. Awesome, thank you so much. And uh, next up, we have IHS Informatics with Ali Habib presenting. Sorry, thanks very much, Chris. Um, so the idea is to present some of the work we're doing with uh, with OpenMRS for TB control. It's a, it's a specific project. Um, I'm going to start by giving you some project context so you understand the, the broad kind of environment that we're dealing with, and then focus on a couple of modules that, that we thought would be of interest to the community. 
which were which were developing for this project, but um, one is already a community supported module. The other one we intend to make one. So that's the idea. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. So quick project detail. Um, this is a, a zero TV project. The idea is to eliminate TV in large metropolitan settings like Karachi in Pakistan, which is a city of 20 million people. Um, and uh, Pakistan is the fifth highest or sixth highest TV burden country in the world. Um, and so the idea was to, to hit TV with everything and the kitchen sink. Um, and so there's, there's multiple TV control interventions that happen in parallel. Um, and we developed uh, a mobile application uh, backed, backed by OpenMRS um, to uh, help with this. It's also included connection with integrated diagnostics as well as a call center. We won't go into that today. Uh, if you could go into the next slide. Great, so um, as I said, uh, multiple TV control interventions, uh, childhood TV, MDR TV, post-exposure therapy, as well as treatment of, of regular TV. And all of these are, are different in their own way. They have different cascades, they have different regimens, uh, in many cases, different diagnostic tests. Um, as well, and they were utilizing mobile WANs in the community to be screening people. So this information system is used at fixed sites, but also on these mobile WANs that you can see in the photo. So the mobile WANs x-ray people as a first uh, step towards uh, determining who needs a PCR for diagnosis, and then it goes on from there. So that's the context. Uh, next slide, please. So the scale as of uh, today, this is a system with 2.5 million patients since 2018 uh, to date, close to 6 million encounters, 62.5 uh, million OBS, OBS, 600 users and 285 locations. So this is the scale uh, that, we're, that we're implementing at. Um, and that's going to uh, result in, I'm gonna, so this, this will translate into some of the problems that I'm going to talk about. So next slide. So one of the modules we developed, and this came largely as a result of the MDR-TV program at, at Indus Hospital, um, having some very uh, significant requirements around testing. Because for MDR-TV patients, you have to run a whole battery of tests um, throughout the, the progress of their treatment. So it's not just about diagnostics, it's, it's every month or every two months for a very long period of time. And there are tests ranging from hearing tests to heart, kidney, across the board, beyond anything to do with the lungs, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So we developed uh, the module, uh, the, com the so common lab test module, which basically lets you uh, create and customize forms to manage test data. Um, this has a legacy OpenMRS uh, web UI, as well as a REST API. So you can add uh, new lab tests um, using configurable, so it's user configurable. You can add new tests as you go. You can decide which tests have specimens and which ones don't, uh, and that's enforced, which I'll, I'll refer to shortly. You can um, upload uh, tests, and um, you can also view, order, and edit lab test information. So the next slide will illustrate this. So this is the workflow that we basically follow. Um, you place a lab test order, and if it is a test that requires a specimen, then a result cannot be entered unless uh, a sample has been uh, collected and accepted by the lab. Um, a lab can request a sample, in which case you need to have a, uh, an accepted sample in the system before you can enter a result. Um, and when the result comes in, you're basically able to just enter that result. So it lets you do all of this yourself. You can make um, kind of new tests as required um, as per your needs. Next slide. So what we're doing now, um, this has been kind of implemented um, since late last year. Um, and now what we're doing is we're working on adding test reference ranges based on age and gender, and then having the system uh, implement some action based on those ranges. So for example, if um, someone is particularly below normal or, or is exceeding something, then you can uh, you know, cause an action to happen, a notification, an SMS message, those sorts of things, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and you can also pull reports based on these reference ranges. The next slide. And so this is the code repository as well as the wiki page for this module. Um, you're welcome to go take a look. Um, and you know, later this year, we should have these updates in place as well. Next slide. 
So this is a data archival module, and this is a direct outcome of the scale that I talked about, because while our reporting is done through a Pentaho-based warehouse, um, the size of the database has got to a point where it's, it's making it difficult for them to even search for patients um, using regular, like forget reporting. Um, and so we're attempting to fix that using a data archival module, uh, which should be available the early version towards the end of this month. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, next slide. So the module will basically allow a set of patients to be archived, which means what do we do when we archive? So we basically remove a set of patient data into alternate tables. In this case, the way it's going to work is that you can use an SQL query. So the early version is going to require you to type an SQL query. Our intent is to later create a query builder, a user interface for this. And then for that set of patients, it will move their encounters, OBS and encounter providers to a separate table. Because what we've managed to identify is that those are the three that are burdening the, the performance of the system. Um, and we provide a log for this. And then if a user wants to, they can search for uh, patients to retrieve them, which means, you know, so they, they could have a criteria, something like anyone who we've had no data entry for over the last eight months, archive them. And then let's say that patient turns up, you are able to retrieve and restore that individual patient um, as required. Next slide. So these are some currently uh, mockups of the UI that, that this will sort of uh, use. So you have a query box and when you type, when you, you know, hit the analyze button, um, it shows you a list of patients who satisfy that query. Um, should you want, you can remove patients from that list. And then there's going to be an archive button under this. Um, so if you go to the next slide, it, you know, it confirms. Uh, next slide, please. And then you have, you know, a success message where the archive has happened. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is how you can uh, retrieve a patient. So once someone's been archived, um, there's, a, there's a number of different criteria you can use to search for them. And then one by one, you can uh, retrieve uh, the patient that you want to restore. So that's the uh, data. And then the, some, you can keep going, you can keep going. Um, so some screenshots of our mobile app, um, if you could keep, go to the next slide. So this is the left, one on the left here is a, is a view of all the different forms in the system. The one on the right is a sample of how patient information is collected. Uh, next slide. This is um, an in the works view of what the lab stuff is going to look like on the mobile app because most of our data entry happens in the field as opposed to um, at fixed sites so we're using an app. So this is the lab modules uh, UI um, on the mobile application. Next slide. Same with this, just more of that. Um, in the interest of time, we can keep going. This is a, on the left side is a patient search. So you can search for a patient by name, by phone number, by ID, by national ID, uh, facility, uh, various different uh, criteria, including program, because as I mentioned, we had you know, five or six different programs running in, in parallel. Um, and this is on the right side is one view uh, of patient data for a specific program. So each program has their own customized view because they all need to see different stuff um, in the field. Uh, next slide. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ali. That was fantastic. Great to hear from you. And wow, there's a lot of shared priorities across the presentations we've already seen today. On that note, I'd like to welcome Anshuman Bhuvaneshwari and um, the other members of the BAMNI team to update us on the features coming out in the 0.93 release. Thanks, Grace. Uh, should I share my screen? Please go ahead. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. I'll start off, then I'll pass it on to Bhuvna and Bindu to talk about this. So as you, many of you might know that like, you know, we are coming on 0 0.93. Uh, 9.2, we didn't do any feature release. It was more of a platform upgrade, but 9.3, lots of features are going to come in. Uh, some of these are more like, you know, towards better access control. Uh, from that, like, you know, what we have done is like, you know, more privileged based accesses to the forms and the reports. 
there's a lot of things that has happened on the bum appointment module uh including the appointment module now being like you know easily or independent one can be shared from uh, used in plain vanilla open mrs as well as on bum uh we are close to migrating to react and there are lots of features i'll let bindu talk about this the forms 2.0 uh, has brought in a lot of more additional controls more about scripting and again uh, bhuvna will run you through uh, we have a lot of uh, internationalization gaps where it was always look like internet i don't think it was like an on demand localizable so this uh, 93 are focused more on the registration and the clinical part and there are new enhancements to the ot scheduling module that we have another thing that uh, we have done is like uh, anything that is marked as saleable can be now synchronized as order to erp uh bhuvna you want to talk over the rest yeah thank you angshu so this feature of uh, privilege based access to forms uh, this has been an ask from the community for quite some time so we've tried to achieve it like achieve it using this uh, like introduction of uh, manage privileges this is a small section that comes in the implementer interface of bamni so uh, like uh, we will we will allow the user to add privileges to the form uh so uh, what 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 how this works is like once this form is given a particular privilege and like uh, in bamni side when you try to uh, log in with that privilege meaning a user with that particular privilege logs in he will be able to view or edit the form according to the like the options given here see if you can see there are like editable and viewable option so based on what is given in the implementer interface that privilege will apply to that particular uh, user like he'll be able to either view it or he'll be able to either edit it so uh, like uh, as you can see in the third uh, uh, screenshot uh, the edit forms uh, tab like you will see when this particular icon of editing or viewing the form will occur according to the privileges uh, given to that particular user so this is uh, this is a uh, privilege based access to forms so angshu can you move to the next uh, slide please so um bindu you will take upon so bindu you will take appointment scheduling bindu okay um i can uh, take this so appointment scheduling we have uh, introduced the recurring appointments as you can see in the left side of the screenshot uh, this is a new feature where like uh, when you create an appointment you get an option of uh, making it a recurring uh, for the given period of time like you can uh, choose the time slot and like you can also choose the appointment date and uh, it repeats based on your need Uh, so this is achieved as a part of uh, this particular uh, feature and also the second thing is multiple providers so first uh, like if you can see the right side uh, screenshot uh, like the, uh, we allow uh, multiple providers to be um, like associated with a single appointment first this feature was not there so now that this has been added to enhance like more uh, providers to uh, handle a single app appointment so that is also a feature that's going to be uh, there in 93 so angshu uh, can you move on to the next screen please yep uh, this is one of a huge uh, feature that's coming up in 93 so uh, to just give an overview we were using like uh, forms 1 Uh, for like most of the implementations are using forms one now you are gradually moving towards forms two and uh, to enable that we have this form builder feature enhancement uh, we have an implementer interface screen that's there for uh, that's it's already there in bamni we have introduced two new features like for event management uh like save event form conditions and form events so like uh, uh, we have added these three features to enable event management from the form level rather than doing it at the clinical form clinical dashboard level 
and also if you can see uh, like there are like introduction of two new uh, uh, features like addition of tables so section so now the main aim of this is like uh, we have made forms to uh, uh, forms to uh, like completely uh, self sufficient and uh, gradually we are moving trying to move from forms one that's the intent and now if you uh, like if you want to have a full fledged uh, demo you can go through the youtube link that's given there it's pretty exhaustive and um, like you can uh, like uh, once you go through you'll be very comfortable designing your full form in this uh, UI. Um, so, Anshu, the next screen, please. Yeah. Uh, just to be precise, when you uh, the save event or the form conditions, right? The screen is going to look like this. So, what is the intent? Is you can give any um, any validation or any uh, function that you are uh, targeting. Uh, you are tar uh, like I think yeah. Bindu is back. She'll be uh, able to take this. Um, Bindu, can you take this? Yeah. Form yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, so uh, due to everyone's uh, uh, the internet is not that stable. Yeah. Uh, I will start with the you know implement interface. Uh, so uh, the implement interface is already been there uh, from nine and uh, eight nine of Bamini, but as part of the nine three. Uh, so we have added a couple of more events uh, with for the existing uh, farm event and control event. Uh, so save event is something that uh, uh, so once you fill all the form, uh, when you just save the you know uh, form. Uh, so there are some groovy scripts that we usually execute. Uh, so which will have an ops. Uh, so that that is something that we used to have. Uh, only uh, we used to you know get access only in the uh, consultation page in the Bamini. Uh, but uh, now, uh, uh, as part of the latest features, we have given a preview feature where you are able to do that uh, you know, save event as part of the you know, creating form. Uh, Abhuvna, uh, can I share the screen uh, just to quickly show that? Yeah, sure, Bindu. Yeah. I can probably just give you a glimpse of how the UI looks. Uh, yeah. I'm just sharing the screen. So if you take this as a form and earlier we used to have only the events which are control events and the farm events. Uh, when I click on control event, you will be able to see some conditions uh, which are in JavaScript and a farm event uh, again in JavaScript. What eventually the control event is something upon clicking on that, uh, when I cl clicking on that some button, uh, the value gets you know, added to the specific uh, you know, uh, concept that we are mentioning. This is control event and farm events are something that when we are loading uh, uh, the whatever the preset values that we are defining that gets loaded. Uh, let's say if I want it, if I don't want to see the weight here. Uh, so that is something that I can define as part of the farm event. But uh, save event is something that we, will, we were able to use only when we were on the consultation page. Uh, I mean, in either in the clinical or in the programs module. But as part of the latest features, we have, you know, we have added that functionality, which will uh, save a lot of time of the implementation implementers. Because uh, earlier, when you, somebody has to you know, test how their groovy skits are working, they have to literally publish the form and go to that uh, consultation page. And then they literally have to test everything is working or not. But here you don't have to you know, switch back and forth between the consultation page and the, you know, uh, the implementer face page. And you can directly see the, uh, you know, whatever the conditions that you have written are working fine or not. And, uh, and th this is actually reducing the lot of effort that we put on the groovy scripts. A day in day out, we can simply write and save event. Uh, it's a simple, uh, no, uh, JavaScript, and then we can execute the same. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. So this form condition is something a new view that uh, where you can see everything in one page, uh, uh, specific to that form and specific to the whatever the events that we have written, how many control uh, events that you have, you can see everything in a one go. Uh, this is about it. And apart from that, uh, so we didn't used to have a section. Uh, whenever I am adding a section, till 9 to used to have only the section uh, which doesn't have the add control, add more. Uh, now we also have the option to add uh, no, uh, more uh, so that you can just uh, no, add it. 
uh, and the other one is table. Uh, table is one component uh, which got added as part of the uh, you know, 9.3 enhancements. Uh, uh, yeah, quickly, this is about the uh, form builder uh, enhancements that I've uh, done as part of 9.3. Uh, Buna, have we given uh, you know, I mean, the features, have we explained about the features of uh, appointment scheduling already? So, uh, apologies, yeah. but we do need to uh, move to the next group. So if you want to wrap up uh, quickly, that would be awesome. Yeah, so, oh. uh, yeah, can I quickly share and with yeah, you? Sure. All right, so this is the last one and this is, uh, other initiatives these are not going to be probably part of 93 but this will coming uh, so thoughtworks is running a covid 19 like in a program and there is already some starter pack which consists of typical metadata forms and reports there is a teleconsultation module coming up we are going to see if it is going to come up with 93 in line otherwise it's a typical web rtc this is a, uh, i don't know if you know about this uh, web based platform jitsi for multimedia voip Etc. and that we are leveraging for doctor-patient teleconsultation. BAMNI as an HIP, this is a lot, much larger discussion, but that's what we are targeting. HIP stands for Health Information Provider, but it has got a certain context. Uh, what we are trying to do is this, like, you know, in a federated health record ecosystem, how do you exchange information based on explicit patient's consent? And all that, like, you know, needs to be done absolutely securely. HTTPS is not a solution. It needs to be end-to-end -end, uh, secure. Uh, I mean, obviously we don't have scope for it, but I hope like, you know, sometime in future, we can show the entire consent management. And that's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Uh, I will definitely be checking out that forms demo myself. Um, over to Jim from, uh, the Palladium and Kenya EMR team. I believe that uh, Jim, you have some things to share with us. And then we will wrap up with Manuel from MSF Belgium. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for that. So I will just briefly take you through um, our presentation and mostly around our achievements um, and uh, basically our next priorities. So overall, we have had a few major uh, wins throughout the period, and um, I think I'll focus on mostly which is uh, the EMR migration. Now, um, there was a drive for migrating of the EMRs, and I think that had been a push by the government of Kenya um, to consolidate the resources around having just one EMR platform to support. I think there were quite a number of platforms, and I think as part of the road to sustainability, uh, they were looking to just have a platform that is easy to and achieve its priorities. Uh, in addition, um, the idea is to move into open source systems like we have with OpenMRS, and I think it was agreed that OpenMRS holds the best platform uh, for the global good. Uh, it's globally recognized and it's a, it has a robust community as we are seeing in this. So that was the ideal, the, the motivation for migration. And um, as part of our deliverable, then we, we went to just figure out how best we can achieve this using the platform. Um, we were able to do an integration with the Pentaho, uh, with the Pentaho system, and that was just essentially to allow us to extract and transform some of the data coming from the different EMRs that are available. Uh, it was supposed to give us a platform that could be able to standardize and basically mask the, the, the logic in a way that uh, it would be easy for us to transform that information. Uh, in addition, we then embarked in looking into the spreadsheet module and open MRS. I think we had already identified that uh, this was something that was already in use, but we needed to just do a, a bit of customization to cover what we essentially needed for the loading of the data into Kenya EMR. Uh, and with those two, then we were able to come up with what we call the toolkit as part of our migration process for, to our Kenya EMR. Um, I'll, I'll, and that was more on the technology side. We had a lot of organizations that were, uh, supporting us through that process. We had CDC, USAID, and DOD. And they basically gave us uh, oversight and coordination through a steering committee. Uh, this was especially important because we are dealing with a large volume of partners and different facilities, close to about 700. And that just gave us the visibility across um, all the different stakeholders. Uh, in addition, we worked with NASCO. And um, 
as part of our iterative process or our agile methodology, we needed to provide a way that um, we could demonstrate workability of this toolkit that we had done. Uh, so we went through a POC model where we walked them through the journey about um, three or four months as we went in and improved the toolkit, showing them different uh, applications and how the data is flowing correctly and how they can get their standardized reports. Uh, in turn, NASCOP was able to just ensure that we had regular stakeholder meetings to ensure that we had buy-in at different areas at that point. And, help, and we developed a strategic plan with them on how we were going to approach the migration. Um, we definitely had different types of clients, different types of partners with different capabilities. So we were able to cluster them together and develop something that could work for everyone. And as part of the process that we're continuing to do, um, we're working with NASCOP, uh, I think they're doing a post-migration assessment to determine the usage and acceptance of the product. I think we've more or less felt that uh, the product has, has been rolled out well, but it's important that we continue to monitor and evaluate that um, we're making the progress that is unnecessary. So as part of the migration, that is what we were able to achieve. And um, I'll just give us um, a few screenshots of the PDI tool and how we were able to just mask the, the logic from the user to be able to extract the information. It was important that we came up with a platform that was easy to use and easily acceptable across the different partners at work. Um, as part of that, if you'll see the spreadsheet module, it is just a module that we were able to import into OpenMRS, but we were able to extend it further by having a, a, a tracker as you can see on the bottom left screen, where you can go through each data set and just view how much records are being processed. Um, it was also broken down into different program areas to allow people to see exactly what it is that is being loaded at any given time. The idea was to give that visibility to the user to be able to have the comfort that all their data is being migrated as we had committed to 100% no data loss. Uh, and I, as I intimated, this is a more or less the organization of the migration process. Uh, we had uh, the MOHUSG providing coordination through the steering committee. We had Palladium who were working with the partners to develop a migration roadmap and develop and validate the toolkit. And we have the support from the county teams and the SIDPs who are basically doing all the sensitization and the actual migration at the facility level. So that is basically how we were organized around the entire process to deliver. Uh, basically, at now, if we're looking at our footprint of the migration, we can consider that we are more or less about halfway. We have managed to migrate about 323 facilities out of 747 in a span of about three or so months, which uh, speaks to the, to the strength of the toolkit and how well it's working. Um, and we are continuing to monitor, and hopefully we should be able to complete in the course of the year. So um, I think that is mainly what we had on our, on our migration dev, um, toolkit. And those are the achievements we had. But we had several other achievements that we took upon uh, for the year. Uh, we developed a COVID-19 tracking system. So this was based on uh, OpenMRS uh, based uh, source based code. And uh, we developed a system that could be able to track all that information using both um, uh, the core and more different mobile applications. Uh, we had several partners during that. Uh, you can see them: M Health, Chai, Medic Mobile, and JK Watch. Uh, and it's basically the system was to act as a central repository for all the data collected through these other systems. So, like Medic Mobile would provide a, a, uh, an, a mobile application to collect information, which would ultimately be consolidated into uh, the COVID-19 Kenya MR system. Uh, we're also thankful to the community. There was a lot of uh, help that we got, especially around uh, managing and developing of the concepts and the other artifacts around the system. Um, another achievement that we were able to do was integrate with CHT. Uh, CHT is a mobile app platform that um, basically develop, allows you to develop mobile applications using a user-centered approach. So one of the different, uh, the difficult um, difficulties we've been experiencing over the years is just to build applications that follow workflows that are simple and give the user control and uh, com just allow them to use the system as well as they need to. So we worked to develop integrations uh, with the Medic Mobile uh, team and develop an, 
a new mobile app that we are now calling Afia Start. Um, I'm sure you'll be seeing it uh, very soon. And that has helped us develop both uh, um, areas for managing programs for key population and HIV testing systems. And that includes uh, workflow based systems that allow the user to be able to be guided through everything that they do. Yeah. So it's mainly patient centered and um, it is, it's basically improving our ecosystem. I think as we build on OpenMRS, we want to build an ecosystem that is easy and uh, as easy as it is for the user to be able to experience. Um, further to that, as part of our usual uh, development, we were able to extend our Kenya MR application to cover several program areas. Uh, that is the OTZ program and the OVC program. I think that was developed and has already been rolled out as part of our, uh, our accomplishments for the year. Um, we were able to integrate our key population system. We were currently managing it as a separate flavor of our current EMR, but we have now consolidated that into a single application for ease of use uh, at the facilities. We've also developed a prep module in the system and uh, that has already been used um, and we continue to support it as best as we could. So I think that just summarizes our, our a uh, number of the achievements that we've been able to uh, achieve over the period. And I'll talk about probably what we see as our priorities. Um, Jim, we are can... unfortunately at time, so if you could wrap up, that would be great. Awesome. So um, as part of our next priorities, we're looking to upgrade our platform. Um, I think our feeling is we would like to be as close as possible to the latest release. So we're looking at that as part of our quota deliverables to moving into 2.0. Um, our work on micro front end continues. I think we've been having joint design sessions with the AMPA team. And we're just looking to build upon that and ensure that we can be able to develop the systems further in the front end architecture. And finally, there are several areas that we expect to improve on our application. That is our integration to the LMS, LMS system, uh, integration to our PS for pharmacy data, and uh, set support for centralized setup of Kenya MR with, together with an update feature. So thank you very much. Uh, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. And before I hand things over to Manuel from MSF, I would I know that some people will have to drop off right now. So I'll just quickly share um, what's happening next in terms of these implementer showcases. If you saw something today that you found particularly interesting, please reach out to the presenter, especially if you're interested in collaborating. Some uh, initiatives uh, have dedicated squads or active project teams in our open source community that, uh, that you can join and, and reach out to. And in terms of OpenMRS support, I let myself or Jen know if you would like a topical collaboration demo or lightning talk session organized on any one of these topics. We'd love to hear from you. In terms of what's coming up next, please uh, hold it on your calendars that November 30th to December 4th, we are having our virtual Open MRS conference. If there's something that you would really like to share at that conference, please reach out to the conference planning team, and that is Jen and Christine. Our next implementer showcase, one of these, is uh, tentatively booked for March 2nd. We could have it earlier if people would like to uh, come together like this earlier in the year as well. So on that note, I will hand it over to Manuel to wrap things up by sharing with us about role-based access control in BOMNI and what they're working on to that end. I'll go ahead and share my screen, but over to you, Manuel. Thank you, Grace, and uh, hello, everyone. Greetings from uh, Spain. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Grace and the organizers for allowing me uh, to participate in the last uh, minute. And uh, today I'm going to present something which uh, actually works, it's done, but something that I expect it will work uh, soon. Uh, but first, uh, some context about me and the project. So I have worked in the past seven years implementing different tools and systems, humanitarian context, from DHS to, to BAMNI to uh, multiple mobile apps. And uh, my background is in engineering, and I'm currently a freelancer working for the University of Oslo. And for Doctors Without Borders, more commonly known as MSF, which are also uh, one of my former employers. So next, please. Some months ago, uh, MSF folks uh, reached out to me to see if we could uh, manage to implement uh, role-based access in uh, BAMNI. 
Uh, MSF is currently using BAMNI in some of their hospitals, but unfortunately there are issues related to data protection and medical confidentiality. One of the more important actually use cases uh, comes from a multidisciplinary approach where MSF employs uh, doctors, psychologists, uh, physiotherapists and social workers to provide different services to the same patient. And all of these providers have access to the whole patient information, but we would like to limit this access and make sure that, for example, sensitive information entered by the psychologist cannot be accessed by the social worker. And also uh, some users will require a read only access here in BAMI, for example, for the purposes of uh, auditing. And this does not exist in the system uh, at present. So to summarize, the goal is to restrict uh, access to personal and sensitive data based on the roles assigned to the user. Next. So the first step was, yeah, that's the, that's the right one. The first step was to assess how BAMNI and OpenMRS are using privileges today to restrict access to some parts of the application. I noticed that there, you know, we can use the required privileges uh, and this can be configured in the, as, as you may know, in the, in the corresponding JSON files. So we can restrict access to entire modules, tabs, uh, restrict access to uh, reports, uh, which, can, which can be launched by the user, access to some um, parts of a module, like uh, dispensing a, a drag. And as the BAMI people confirm in their presentation today, also role-based access will be released for uh, forms in the next uh, BAMI uh, version. So what isn't working and is a must uh, for uh, MSF? Next. So we need to uh, be able to restrict access to personal data, meaning hiding data that makes possible to identify the patient. And it is not necessary for uh, the provider to do a, a consultation. This could be national ID, address, uh, the photo. Normally, these fields are, are stored in a table. You know this, uh, they are uh, called personal attributes in BAMNI. And as you can see in the screenshots, this is, uh, I mean, all over the place in the, in the, in the tool. Uh, and also, it's important to notice that we need to protect this access from the, uh, from the API. Another thing to, go, to consider. Next. Um, this uh, I don't think we can do at present, so we need to be able to uh, restrict uh, the display controls that people are, that the users can see, also based on the roles. And also um, within the display controls, uh, you, can, you can display different concepts, uh, observations based on the concepts. So we would like to define um, what concept you know can be actually uh, seen by, let's say, by a, by a user also based on the, on the role. Next. Um, I was also uh, testing the access to, uh, to programs and as you can see you have a, even though, I mean, you don't have the privileges to add or edit uh, uh, a, a program um, that it shows, you know, uh, the, the tool is showing today that uh, you can edit, uh, delete, enroll, save. So when you try to perform the operation, you get the errors that you see in the screen. But we will actually, I think, it would be better to simply remove those that, that kind of stuff, you know, and to make clear for people that they cannot uh, uh, save or edit or do any any, any modifications to uh, to a patient enrolling in a in a program. And at the same time, which I think is something is not working today, we need to be able to access uh, all the program details uh, in uh, as a reader, as a viewer only. Next. And uh, yeah, we have also um, a request to uh, restrict access to some particular widgets or some modules, like a good example would be order drug in the medication uh, tab for consultation. At present, we can actually use uh, privileges to uh, remove uh, or to, to restrict access to uh, dispensing, but we cannot have the same for uh, ordering a drug or prescribing. And then finally, also, we need to take into consideration the uh, operations that are running in the back end. When you're running SQL queries in reports, or I can also think about patient queues, uh, data filter, and so forth. So, so those could be actually back entry doors to access some uh, sensitive or personal data. And we also need to, to consider uh, that kind of access. Next. So I want to clarify now a few things about this project. Uh, this uh, feature will be entirely paid by MSF Belgium. So the people working in the organization 
are of course the main stakeholders, but we are also in touch with other key people in other MSF sections to make, make sure we do something which is uh, valuable uh, for the entire MSF movement. Also, we are constantly communicating with data protection officers to make sure we are compliant with the law, uh, concretely with the GDPR. But finally, and, and it's also capital to the success of this project, we want to implement something which can benefit the whole OpenMRS and BAMNI uh, community, as we are all aware that this feature has been long requested by many users in the field. So this is why actually I'm talking to you uh, today. Um, also, as you can see, there is a project uh, timeline. Um, basically, for the next two weeks, I will be finalizing a request uh, for proposals, an RFP, which will be released uh, at the end of the month. And I encourage anyone listening who might have a BAMNI expertise to respond with a proposal, detailing uh, the approach, timeline, budget, and so forth. And then with all the responses during the month, of, uh, during November, I will create a, a business case analysis, which will be used by the members of um, the steering committee in MSF to choose the candidate which will implement this feature. Um, the work is supposed to start hopefully by uh, at, uh, at the beginning of December. Next. So that's uh, all for me. Uh, if you have questions, comments, uh, feedback, you want to share your use case, your frustrations, your expectations, do not hesitate to contact me and I'm looking forward to discussing with more people in the community and good luck for the respondents. Thank you, Grace. Over. Thank you so much, Manuel. And a huge thank you to everyone who participated today. This was great as a, as a, first, a first try of our new implementer showcases. So once again, if you saw something that interested you today, reach out to the presenter or consider making a post in Talk or Slack and OpenMRS and reach out to the community. Um, there, there may already be ongoing work um, that, that people can pitch in on. Once again, please hold the dates on your calendars for the OpenMRS conference um, where more things like this will be shared. We'll also have our next quarterly implementer showcase uh, in early March, or let me know if you would prefer it sooner and we can book it sooner as well. Thank you everyone. Hope you have a great rest of your week.